Hello world! Welcome back to this tutorial on writing a programming language compiler. Um, yeah, in the last videos we've uh, talked extensively about uh, context-free grammars and uh, the LL method and the LR method of generating uh, source codes from these um, context-free grammars and yeah, today I mean, these are relatively uh, theoretical topics, but um, today we will be looking at Bison, uh, which is a program that um, yeah, does the LR method uh, automatically. So uh, it does all this complicated stuff for you. And um, yeah, we've prepared this, um, these um, uh, classes here for um, arithmetic expressions and Boolean expressions and uh, statements and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, now I will start uh, building a program uh, um, that uses Bison and Flex and um, uh, yeah, the Bison code will then use all these classes uh, to represent the abstract syntax tree on the heap. So yeah, let's uh, start by creating a new file, parser.y. I mean, some people um, uh, give uh, Bison files uh, the ending .yy, others .y, and uh, I really don't care much. Uh, this y is short for yuck, by the way, which stands for yet another compiler compiler, um, which is, yeah, an, was an old program that did the same things and uh, Bison is like uh, based on that. So uh, hence the name, you know, Yak and Bison. Okay. Uh, they are similar animals. Um, okay, for t some um, tidiness, I will uh, move these classes for the AST. into a subdirectory called AST. Main CVP stays here, make file parser y. Okay. Uh, we had also um, written this uh, flex program here. Um, and if you remember, I said that um, parsing usually uh, happens in two stages, a lexical analysis and then a syntactic analysis. And yeah, this flex file um, does the, the lexical analysis for us. It turns your raw data into a stream of tokens. And um, yeah, then uh, the parser will take that stream and uh, get the um, the uh, context-free grammars um, uh, syntax uh, from that token stream and uh, will then deliver that back to the main CPP. Okay, so let's start Kate as per usual. Okay, and now let's uh, take a few things from these files from the Lexa. I'll first copy everything. Um, yeah, this uh, don't need this switch case statement here. Um, yeah, this is also not really necessary. Uh, I just wanted um, this to remind you that uh, Alexa is called by uh, calling this YYLEX function on it. So, uh, yeah. OK. 
Okay. Okay, so now we have access to that Lexa um, and we've uh, instantiated one. We are deleting it down here again. Um, yeah, all this stuff here, uh, which we um, hard coded. Uh, yeah, in the future, this will not be hard coded anymore. So. Uh, So I just remove that and um, um, yeah, I will need a pointer here for a program, but um, yeah, I, that's why I leave that here. Um, okay, now since we don't uh, explicitly um, instantiate all these things, uh, we don't need uh, these includes here anymore. We only need the base include, which uh, general, which declares this statement here and the context and uh, this method here. So um, yeah, that's why we still need the base.h, but all the others could go. Okay, now let's talk about this Bison file. Um, like flex. Um, Bison has also these um, two lines with uh, percent percent, which uh, separates the file in three sections. Up here you set some options. Here in the second part, um, this is where you define your rules. So this is really where you put your context-free grammar. And then down here uh, you can have some additional uh, C or C++ code, uh, which will uh, be put into the generated file at the end of the generated file also, because again, Bison also generates a source code from your rules here and your options. Okay, so let's start by writing some of the um, context-free grammar rules. As usual, I will have a, uh, a non-terminal called s for the start terminal and uh, this s is supposed to produce a list of statements and then and after that there is supposed to be the end of file you know we've talked about that in the last video and uh, yeah the um, the bison grammar for that is you put a colon here instead of this arrow and a semicolon at the end of the uh, of the rule and uh, yeah for clarity for for tidiness I personally prefer to put this in the next line indent it and uh, the semicolon um, outdent outdented um, at the same level of the uh, of the non-terminal so that you can clearly see, okay, this uh, rule goes from here to here, because uh, things will get a bit uh, less tidy later. Okay, so the statements. Um, again, next line, indented. Uh, statements can either be empty or a list of statements followed by a state Okay. Now, um, um, this first rule says, uh, okay, an, an empty list of statements is a valid list of statements, right? I mean, lists can be empty. Um, and it would be legal to uh, express it like this. But uh, yes, sometimes you just... Um, you, you could just accidentally have such an uh, uh, an empty rule, may, maybe by accidentally writing uh, two pipes here, as you would do it in um, in C and C++. So uh, it's better to actually say 
uh, to say percent empty, which uh, tells Bison clearly, okay, I meant this to be empty. And yeah, when you have used this empty anywhere in your uh, in your rules, then um, this tells Bison that uh, if you accidentally have something somewhere else, like uh, foo colon uh, bar or, or but okay, um, if you have this percent empty at least once anywhere in your um, in your rules, then this tells Bison uh, that you explicitly tell it where it's supposed to have empty rules and then it will just not accept this down here. It will then say, hey, this is, uh, you've had empty once, so uh, you told me if you want empty rules, you will tell me explicitly this is supposed to be empty, so it will complain about this, okay? So this, uh, so declaring this uh, explicitly as empty is just, um, uh, turns on a protection to, um, to protect you from accidentally having uh, such empty rules. Now, what can a statement be? A statement can be an assignment. Assignment looks like this. A value. Assignment operator like an equal sign in C or a colon equal in Pascal or something. And uh, uh, if you assign the result of an arithmetic expression to it, and at the end, um, such a statement is supposed to be ended with a semicolon. Okay. Um, what you already uh, might have spotted, um, I'm writing tokens in uppercase and uh, non-terminals in lowercase, just so that uh, uh, this helps you to visually uh, distinguish them. Okay. What else could a statement be? Um, we could have an if open parenthesis, then a boolean expression, close parenthesis, and then a statement. And I'm uh, deliberately doing it wrong here so uh, that we can later talk about this problem here. Uh, statement else statement or while open boolean expression close statement okay now we have boolean expressions and arithmetic expressions in here so One kind of Boolean expression would be a relational expression. And uh, yeah, for now I will just leave it like that. Um, a relational expression for now is just going to be an arithmetic expression, uh, greater or equal. Another arithmetic expression. And an arithmetic expression for now is going to be a number arithmetic expression plus arithmetic expression or a multiplication of arithmetic expressions. And I will also allow L values. Okay, and yeah, L values for now is just going to be an identifier. So a, a variable name basically. Okay, so this is um, part of uh, the, um, of the context-free grammar that we've discussed extensively. But um, yeah, like this, Bison would only be able to say, okay, I have a context-free grammar. I can now check if 
the token stream I'm getting from the Lexa uh, is valid relative to that uh, context-free grammar, but um, it wouldn't yet do anything with that. So, um, uh, as I said, we want to build the abstract syntax tree on the heap. And uh, right now, Bison just wouldn't do that because, uh, yeah, we don't tell it to do anything with the data, right? It, it can only look at the data and say, okay, this uh, it matches, but um, how would uh, Bison decide to do anything with the data that uh, uh, that it's getting? You know, we need to tell it to do something with it uh, so that uh, we can uh, use it somehow. Okay, um, I think it would be a good idea to do something like um, talk about, um, let's say, a equals five is our input. Okay, so we would expect this to um, to pass to an L value assign arithmetic expression semicolon, right? So there's a is my L value. Uh, the equal sign is this assignment and five is the arithmetic expression, okay? So let's say this is what we are parsing and uh, this would mean that from the Lexa we would get an identifier, an assignment uh, for this equal sign, then a number and a semicolon. And now we need to turn uh, this into an L value, you know, because uh, here we have L value assign arithmetic expression. Uh, this needs to become an arithmetic expression. And then L value assign arithmetic expression can become a statement. And uh, yeah, this is as far as I want to talk about this. Um, so, um, so yeah, let's say we get an identifier, assign number, semicolon from the Lexa. Now, um, something very cool about Bison is that you can assign um, code to your rules. Like when we get this identifier here, we can uh, assign some code with this rule. So, um, so if we get this identifier, then uh, we could say something like standard C out. I received an identifier. Okay. And uh, yeah, I don't know, let's say uh, for the number we could uh, also do that. Um, yeah, but just uh, writing something on uh, standard out uh, doesn't help us uh, later on, right? So uh, we still want to build the abstract syntax tree on the heap. So. Um, so what we would want to do here is, um, well, for a number, we had this arithmetic expression constant. And for an identifier, uh, we had this location value variable class, right? So we would want to um, We would want to create an arithmetic expression constant object here and, uh, and a location value variable here. Okay. So, um, but this um, constructor here expects a parameter, right? So, um, this uh, location value variable expects a string. And yeah, the, um, the Lexa gives us a string, 
Okay, I mean, right now it just uh, stores it somewhere, but uh, uh, we'll do that uh, differently later. And then um, the Lexa will pass that data to the parser, and then the parser um, will then be able to take that data, and we can then access it uh, by using dollar, and then um, the name of the symbol here, like identifier. Or up here you could have a dollar number um, okay so that's a really cool thing um, so now we can put that on the heap but now it's only here in this um, in this identifier we need to have a way to pass it up to the next level here okay and yeah, Bison is super helpful in that because you just say dollar dollar equals, and this is how you pass it up in the abstract syntax tree. Okay, so if you do this, then this L value is, uh, um, then this uh, object is passed to, uh, to this case here with this uh, L value assigned. And then here, if we um, want to create a statement for this assignment, you now it has a, it gets an L value and an expression. Uh, here we can then say dollar dollar equals new statement assign and take this L value by saying dollar L value. <laughs> Yeah, you just reference the name of the non-terminal and uh, over here you would take the thing that you get from the arithmetic expression from here. Um, and yeah, that, that's very helpful, right? So uh, this makes things quite easy if you ask me. Um, one thing I want to point out uh, here we put the data um, on the heap, you know, we allocate a new string uh, just to copy the data of YY text because YY text will be validated after the this rule has applied. So uh, we need to copy it somewhere else. That's why we um, that's why we store it on the heap with a new string. Um, but yeah, this L value variable expects yeah something that isn't a pointer so i mean we could change it to take a pointer but um uh, yeah some th this is something that i have often encountered that um, you would dereference uh, this thing and then delete it later you know so um so here we make another copy of that text, and uh, then we need to throw it off the uh, off the heap. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe don't have a equals five. Let's say a equals five plus three, so that we get two numbers. So um, now we come to a problematic case here because um, yeah, here we have arithmetic expression plus arithmetic expression and the result is also an arithmetic expression. So this is um, if, uh, so here you have a problem. You cannot just say a dollar arithmetic expression because uh, there are multiple arithmetic expressions here. And if you wanted to reference dollar arithmetic expression, um, then yeah, Bison wouldn't know which one you mean. So you need to uh, have a way to uh, distinguish these arithmetic expressions. And um, yeah, you can uh, rename your things uh, by using brackets here. And um, I always like to. Uh, in, in these arithmetic expression cases, I always like to give them the names L and R, you know, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So then you could uh, say dollar dollar 
equals new arithmetic expression plus dollar l dollar r okay problem solved now let's talk about this case here um, here we receive an l value and we want to produce an arithmetic expression right but if you remember the um, the class hierarchy here uh, the location value is already an arithmetic expression so uh, we wouldn't even have to do anything with it so we could just say dollar dollar equals dollar l value um, but um, we don't need to do that because uh, this is a standard behavior for bison rules so um, if you don't have any code associated with your rule then um, the default behavior of bison is to pass the value of the leftmost symbol up the uh, the tree so we can just omit this and it's perfectly fine okay Here, this is again a case, a relational expression was derived from Boolean expressions. So again, we could say dollar dollar equals dollar relational expression. But again, since the relational expression is the leftmost one here, we can again omit that. Okay. And uh, yeah, this is really approaching something usable here. Yeah, here we only have one statement, but um, yeah, the, the non-terminal it produces is also a statement and uh, yeah, Bison would still complain here. So um, because it would say this could also reference this one here, but um, in my opinion, that doesn't make sense. But uh, yeah, we still uh, need to rename it here. So I will usually name it T like uh, a then case. So then T and E for then case and else case. Yeah, something that I uh, often do when I uh, have something that produces a list of something else, like uh, here you have a, this uh, uh, this non-terminal statements uh, which generates uh, a list of or in any sequence of statement objects. Um, I often uh, do things like this. Um, that um, I would have the name of the non-terminal here uh, with an additional S behind it to signify th uh, this produces multiple of this. And then uh, start with empty and uh, this left recursive uh, uh, description that I've talked about, which uh, the Bison developers advise you to use because it allows you to use a smaller stack. A list of statements is a block. 
So, so we will produce a block object. So dollar dollar equals new statement block and uh, that thing expected a standard vector of statements as a parameter okay I will just pass an empty uh, uh, vector here um, but uh, yeah I will make this uh, public for now so that I can down here take the uh, take this state this block object that I get from up there you know dollar s is now a block um, the block that we've generated here and um, then Yeah, then I will uh, look into that object, uh, go to the statements vector there and add the statement that we've ju just read. Okay. Okay, this looks pretty good. Um, now let's look into the make file. Um, we've had this uh, code for compiling C++ programs, or C++ uh, translation units. Um, we've had this make file, which called flex for these lexa files. And um, yeah, we can now just say uh, make a, a similar rule for dot uh, y files, which uh, again has dash o dollar add to um, to set the um, the cpp file as output file, but Bison doesn't uh, take a dash i to specify the input file. You know, this is the input file, the dot uh, y file. So um, yeah, let's just uh, uh, take that make file and um, and let's see what happens when we say make parser dot cpp. Okay, it complains about a lot of things. Um, yeah, it basically complains about all the uh, all the tokens because because we haven't told it that these things here are tokens. You know, I mean the um, an arithmetic expression. Well, this is the left hand side of such a colon, so uh, Bison knows. Okay, then arithmetic expression is probably a uh, a non-terminal, but uh, but uh, yeah, if I mean, of course, it could just say everything that isn't a non-terminal uh, is then a, a token, but uh, yeah, uh, that's not how uh, how Bison works and. Um, yeah, we, we just need to give it a, a list of these tokens. So what tokens do we have? We have talk EOF. Um, we have tokens for assign, for semicolon, for open, close. I always like to group these tokens uh, like uh, if, else, while are the things that uh, correspond to uh, to the program flow control. OK, 
Okay, I think I have listed all the tokens now. Now it's complaining that dollar uh, $L is not defined in line 87. And it's correct. L and R haven't been named. Okay, now, um, as I said, uh, I've written these rules in a stupid way. You know, I've uh, just said an arithmetic expression is arithmetic expression plus arithmetic expression or arithmetic expression or arithmetic expression mult arithmetic expression. And we've talked about that. Um, when you make this, when, when you write your rules like that, then uh, Bison doesn't know if you have something like uh, 5 plus 3 plus 10, uh, it wouldn't know how to um, how to shift and reduce, you know, because uh, these things are uh, ambiguous. You could uh, you could first uh, uh, reduce the first two uh, symbols to one arithmetic expression and then combine that with the last one. Uh, yeah, well, we've talked about that, right? And uh, yeah, this is really what happens if uh, uh, if you don't resolve this problem, then Bison will tell you, "Hey, I have shift reduce conflicts here." Um, and um, yeah, Bison is really helpful with these problems. Um, I mean, first of all, you could just tell it to uh, to ignore these uh, shift reduce conflicts. You could just say uh, percent expect five okay because five shift reduce conflicts now it says okay i have five shift reduce conflicts but you told me five of them are okay so it would ignore them but i would really not advise you to do that because um, uh, yeah if if you just ignore shift reduce conflicts and by the way with uh, expect dash RR, you could uh, ignore reduce reduce conflicts, but uh, again, don't ignore these conflicts because if you ignore them, uh, then um, your parser will just sometimes behave unexpectedly, and uh, yeah, something like a programming language should not behave unexpectedly. It should always uh, behave very predictably. So uh, I can really not uh, stress enough that. Uh, you really shouldn't ignore uh, these conflicts. Um, I have actually only one case ever uh, where I legitimately ignored them and told it to ignore them because um, that was with an with, with a uh, absolutely ambiguous uh, grammar. So there were really were different ways to uh, interpret things and. Uh, yeah, it was a language that wasn't under my control. It was for COBOL. And yeah, COBOL is ambiguous. So uh, what I did was I would I used GLR parsing, which says, okay, if you have a conflict, if something isn't clear, just go in both ways and uh, give me both results. And then you need to write something that's called a merge procedure, which then selects which of the results it wants to have you know that and that's really crazy and i really can only advise you to stay away from stuff like that because it's really difficult and uh, yeah every time you uh, you change the uh, the grammar this number of shift reduce and reduce reduce conflicts can change and then you have to go through all these uh, conflicts and uh, check hey, are these conflicts that are handled by my merge rules? If so, ignore them. Otherwise, uh, you need to do something. So every time the number of these conflicts changes, you need to go through all of them and verify again that, uh, that uh, it's still uh, correct. So it makes things so much harder. But uh, OK, I digress. Um, so I, uh, I won't ignore the <laughs> shift reduce conflicts. Um, uh, instead, I uh, will address them. And um, 
yeah, one way to address them is to pass uh, the parameter dash v. When you do that, um, then um, Bison uh, generates this log file parser.output and uh, yeah, it tells you here uh, in state 26 I have one shift reduce conflict, in state 27 I have two shift reduce conflicts, in state 28 also. Then it has a list of your grammar, uh, your tokens, your non-terminals, and then yeah, this is what I told you in the last video. Uh, here you have a list of all your states of that uh, uh, of your um, of that uh, pushdown automaton, and here you would have uh, the LR information, L value assign point, arithmetic expression semicolon, right? And this is the action table. Uh, if I get a number now, then I shift and go to state 13. If I get an identifier, shift and go to state 7, and so on. So this is what I told you that uh, the log file for, for Bison is super helpful. It, it tells you so exactly what, uh, what it does. Uh, you can also um, pass Bison the parameter uh, dash dash graph and uh, then it will create a .gv file. A .gv file is for graphvis and uh, yeah, then you can uh, well you can install the program graphvis but there's also uh, um, there's online tools for uh, graphvis so uh, you could uh, uh, take the data you get from that and uh, pass that into uh, Graphvis and then it will give you uh, such a graphical representation here. And uh, yeah, what was the 26 to 28 were the problematic states. And yeah, look at that. I have if open b close statement point is a reduce <laughs> information because the point is at the end of the rule. But I have also if open b close statement point else statement is a shift information and that's why it's a shift reduce conflict. Okay, and here we have arithmetic expression plus and arithmetic expect but also arithmetic expression plus arithmetic expression point. You know if uh, if you have uh, 5 plus 3, you can reduce that, or you could read the next plus and uh, uh, go on shifting. You know, we've talked about these problems, and um, yeah, so, um, so when you have shift reduce conflicts, uh, you, you can uh, solve them. Um, as I said uh, one way to solve them would be to um, to change your uh, context-free grammar which I think is the cleaner way but um, yeah uh, another way to solve the um, uh, the problems with uh, the operator rank and the uh, associativity is um, you can say percent left to say uh, plus is left associative and then you say percent left mult to say multiplication is left associative and since this mult is below the plus it means it has a higher rank so uh, things that have the same rank like plus and minus uh, you would put on the same line here. There is also non-ASOC for non-associative. Uh, that's something that you might use for 
a knot in Boolean expressions, for example. So let me put this here. Okay. And yeah, now you only have one shift reduce conflict. Um, oh, by the way, because uh, this uh, hint here is uh, again something very uh, helpful. Uh, dash w counter examples. Um, you can run Bison with the parameter dash w counter examples. And um, yeah, it will then tell you, um, it, it will give you a problematic case, you know, if if open be close, if open be close, statement else statement, right? And uh, so it says here I could turn the, the rightmost if open be close statement else statement into a statement and then have if open be close statement or uh, the other way I can interpret that is I can reduce this if open be close statement to this statement here and then I would have if open be close statement else statement so the dangling else problem you know this uh, here you would associate the else statement with the outer if uh, here you would associate the else with the inner if and okay um, we've talked about this um, now this can be solved um, in a quite strange way um, because uh, the, the precedence of uh, of any rule is the precedence of the last terminal, you know, and here the last terminal is the else, and here it's close. So we could just say percent precedence uh, close, and then further down, so with a higher precedence, the else, and that would just now say that this rule has a higher precedence than this. But that makes things so weird because, I mean, having a different precedence between close and else, that, that's kind of weird. So uh, uh, something that you could do is you could just invent some new uh, terminal and um, then um, say this rule now has a precedence of that of the terminal. Strangely enough, if you would now um, define a, a precedence bar instead of else, um, that would uh, strangely still have the problem. I uh, really don't understand why, um, but uh, yeah, so. Uh, this gets rid of the problem, but uh, honestly, I'm not even sure if that now uh, prefers, uh, if, if that now associates the else with uh, the outer or the inner if. So, uh, yeah, if you ask me, just uh, fix it on the, uh, uh, on the level of, um, of the, um, of your rules, you know, don't do this. Uh, I mean, um, these problems are problems with your context-free grammar. So um, I think it's a better way to really just have a have a context-free grammar that doesn't have the problem. Uh, I think that's just a better solution than having the problem and then telling Bison to uh, to solve this problem in this or that manner. You know, if if your context-free grammar just doesn't have these problems then I think you're better off, you know. So uh, we could have, uh, as we've discussed before, um, we could
could uh, instead have statement i and statement c for complete and incomplete statement. An assignment is a complete statement. Um, An if then else, an if then without an else is incomplete. So this is not here. Um, uh, in front of an else, you are, you only allow complete statements. And uh, yeah. Uh, if you don't have a complete statement after the else, that would make, make the whole statement incomplete. So this needs a complete statement. And a, a while is only complete if it ends with a complete statement. Now incomplete, uh, yeah, an assignment is something complete. If open be close, statement, any statement, you know, no matter which, uh, that's already incomplete because we don't have an else. So it doesn't matter if you have statement I or statement C here. Um, in front of a, an else you only allow complete statements. And uh, if you end with an incomplete statement after an else, you're again incomplete. If you end with an incomplete statement after a while, you're incomplete. Okay, and uh, yeah, the solution that I've that we've talked about uh, for arithmetic expressions. Uh, yeah, I like to uh, to use the names arithmetic expressions a for something that has a precedence of an addition so that uh, here you have uh, plus and minus or you can directly go to the next uh, level M now an arithmetic expression M is a multiplication, a division, something with the precedence of a multiplication, you know. That's why uh, I put the M here. is a atomic case where we have numbers and L values and uh, we can also um, have open parentheses then an arithmetic expression A So any arithmetic expression is fine between uh, parentheses. And uh, yeah, since this arithmetic expression here uh, is not the first uh, symbol, um, the default rule would not uh, propagate this arithmetic expression. It would propagate the open. And since that doesn't have a value, uh, uh, that wouldn't make sense. So. So 
So this is uh, how you can solve these things in your context-free grammar level. And, and look at that, no shift reduce conflicts, although uh, we've removed all these declarations for the, um, uh, for the precedents. Okay, I think you now see how this works, um, but uh, right now, I mean, yeah, Bison accepts this input, but if you would now uh, uh, try to compile that, uh, yeah, um, uh, G++ will complain about a lot of things. Uh, so similar to flex, uh, you need to put some additional code to the front of the file. In this case, uh, you would include um, your header files. this is now a lot less uh, um, problems but uh, we still have more problems um, we are using vectors you know here in the, here we are, we are using vectors so Okay, so now we have these uh, includes and uh, yeah, now it, uh, everything has uh, gotten much worse. Um, so um, now it says uh, statement block. Okay, it, it now knows what a statement block is, for example, uh, but it tries to convert a statement block to something called YYS type. And uh, yeah, okay, what uh, is that? Um, yeah, you know, when, uh, uh, when you pass data from the lower nodes of your abstract syntax tree up to the higher nodes of the abstract syntax tree, uh, these things need to be stored somewhere. You know, uh, they are stored on the stack with the, um, with the, with the symbols. Um, but uh, yeah, right now, Bison has no idea uh, what to use for uh, as a, a data type for the things that we put there. You know, uh, we haven't told Bison which data type to use for that. So uh, uh, yeah, we need to do that. So. How do we do that? Um, we say percent union. Okay. And uh, in this union, we can now um, put, uh, I mean, a union is uh, something that's not really used much these days. It's been, that was kind of like an, an old version of polymorphism, if you want. Uh, I don't want to go into what a union is in C++. Um, uh, let's just say you can put multiple objects in there, like in a class, but a class would have all the objects at the same time. A union is like, uh, it can be only one of the objects at the same time. Okay, might be a bit weird if, if that doesn't make enough sense to you. Uh, then just look it up. Uh, I don't want to go into that too much. So uh, well, one thing is uh, in your union, you can only have uh, uh, primitive things like integers or uh, pointers. So uh, um, so 
So um, let's have an integer value, a string value. They are always um, useful. Then we could put uh, a statement called statement. Boolean expression called Boolean expression. Um, So basically for all the base types, um, I've put um, a pointer here um, with very clear names, but uh, I also want a case for a block because otherwise uh, this case here would not make sense. So uh, okay, now this defines a type that is used uh, for passing the things up the um, up the abstract syntax tree and um, yeah you could now um, uh, if i remember correctly you could now do something like uh, replace this with uh, dollar and then statement in these uh, pointy uh, parentheses um, to select which of these uh, you would use. Uh, but uh, honestly, this is what I've done when I started doing all this stuff, uh, because I didn't know any better. Do yourself a favor, don't do it like that, because it gets so messy. Um, it's just much better to, um, um, to declare a type for the non-terminals. So you could say, um, the non-terminal statement, you know, the um, this here um, has this type. So you you address your types by the name uh, inside the union. So type of statement is statement. Incomplete, complete statement also have that type. Um, this is a bit redundant, but uh, okay. Okay, now what we still need is uh, for, for this non-terminal, you know, here we uh, explicitly create a block and then down here we treat it as a block. So, uh, I mean, we could pass this as a statement also, but um, uh, then down here we would uh, need to uh, reinterpret that pointer. And I think it, uh, it's just more elegant to say that uh, statements uh, uh, returns a block. Okay, now let's try this again. And 
okay, that's uh, much better now. But uh, now it's still complaining about the type of number and identifier, which were tokens. So, uh, but these are the tokens, if you remember, um, which uh, carry some data uh, coming from the Lexa. And for these, you can uh, also define a type, int value and string value. Okay, the string was a pointer, yeah. This looks much better. It's complaining a bit about these default rules here because, uh, yeah, uh, it doesn't understand the inheritance that we've used. You know, a relational expression was derived from Boolean expression, if you remember that uh, here. But uh, yeah, Bison doesn't know that, it doesn't understand that, so it complains that uh, you cannot assign a relational expression to a Boolean expression. Yeah, let's just, uh, let's just make this explicit here and uh, also here. Okay, and it also wants semicolon here. Okay, now, um, yeah, it seems, uh, ah, yeah, the stuff that I'm seeing here, uh, yeah, this is stuff that uh, you would have in the C version of the compiler. So uh, I'm writing a C++ compiler, of course. So, so um, yeah, Bison uses these skeleton files, uh, which I think are something like M4 scripts or so. Uh, I've looked into some of them once, but I really wasn't able to make sense of them. So, and I didn't really find much useful information online. So, um, but the thing is uh, lalr1.cc. Uh, is a skeleton file for generating C++ code. Uh, I think by default uh, Bison generates C code. So let's see what it does now. And now it's only complaining about uh, yylex. And if you remember, yeah, yylex was the name of the function that's generated by flex. So this is a problem now in the communication between Bison and flex. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, this video is long enough already, so uh, we will need to uh, talk about this in another video. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, okay, Bison is a huge topic. Uh, I'm actually not surprised that uh, this uh, was more than uh, the scope of one video. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, absolutely tune in for the next video. Then we will uh, get all the communications right, and then uh, we will have an actual programming language uh, parser. Um, and with the helper classes that we've uh, written last time, um, this will be an actual programming language interpreter or something like an, a, a scripting language. Um, and yeah, the code generation, the generation of, um, of uh, assembler code after that, is relatively easy compared to what we did today. But uh, of course, it's still uh, quite complicated. But um, yeah, absolutely don't miss the next video. Uh, we will put everything together and then uh, we will have something uh, that works and uh, does stuff. So uh, yeah, tune in next time. Uh, if you like this video, like it, share it, subscribe, and see you next time.